Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is actually echo up Ron Nelson and thank the organizers for putting together this fantastic meeting. Um, I should say that my background is not really in, in, in Casimir forces. Uh, my background is in kind of atomic physics and quantum optics. And, and so because of that, I thought I'd maybe take the first few minutes um, and give you a perspective of why Casimir forces started to become uh, important and interesting for, for me and, and for people like me in, in this community. Um, so the game that, that we've been trying to play for a long time is getting uh, strong coherent interactions between single atoms and single photons. So a single atom as an optical device is actually pretty remarkable. It's a very nonlinear optical element, and you can use it to generate non-classical <laughs> states of light. Um, if you can make that interaction efficient, so for example, if you can uh, put the atom in a high finesse fabric pro cavity and make the photon hit the atom many times, um, then the interaction becomes efficient, and then you can imagine taking a photon that's created by an atom, uh, sending it uh, through some optical fiber to another atom far away, and uh, from there it's starting to build up more complex quantum devices and networks. So something like a basic quantum uh, internet, if you want. Um, so that all sounds kind of good in, 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 in concepts. In practice, uh, you have a bit of a problem because one atom in one cavity in a lab looks like that. Okay. So you can't have your quantum iPhone looking like that. And so you know, it's, been a lot, it's been a big problem. These, these experiments are hard for a lot of reasons. But starting around a decade ago, um, people decided, or some people in the community thought that one way to simplify at least some aspects of these experiments is to move from free space optics to micro and nanophotonics. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of different flavors of micro and nanophotonic systems you can imagine. Uh, to me, the most exciting one is uh, photonic crystals. So let me just kind of give a brief overview of uh, the state of the art of the field. Um, so what you see here is a kind of several millimeter uh, chip scale device, silicon nitride on silicon. Um, we can zoom in a little bit. You actually see it's a whole array of devices. Um, this red rectangle is just one device. Um, here's a kind of schematic of that. Um, this kind of big cylinder here, which you see on this point, is just a normal glass fiber. So that's how you get light into and out of the device with a reasonably <laughs> high efficiency. Um, there's a lot of stuff here which is just technical, so this is um, all suspended. It's several millimeters long, but only several hundred nanometers thick in cross-section. So there's a lot of kind of mechanical supports and, and things there for thermal management. And the photonic crystal is just this part in the middle here. So the photonic crystal is some kind of uh, dielectric waveguide which is periodically corrugated. So then the way that light propagates is described by block band structure. Um, you can dramatically modify the way that light propagates compared to a normal waveguide or compared to free space. So you see actually kind of two dielectric waveguides that are uh, parallel uh, in this, in this uh, SEM image here. And the goal is to somehow bring a cloud of cold atoms nearby and to trap uh, the cold atoms within this kind of 200, 300 nanometer gap between the two waveguides. And by that route, open up kind of efficient interactions between individual atoms and photons in the guided modes. So I'll talk a little bit more about how you might get atoms into that uh, kind of intervening space. Um, but you know, these experiments exist. Uh, they've been around for you know, two or three years now. And it's a, to me, it's a really kind of exciting development for the field of atomic physics. Um, I should say, you know, when this field started, the whole game was to kind of do old things better. So you can have a big fabric pearl cavity, technically it's hard. You can have, now these days, small photonic crystal cavities. And originally, the, the, the line of thought was, well, a cavity is a cavity. So there's this famous James Cummings model, for example, that describes uh, theoretically the interaction between an atom and a, and a single cavity mode. And if that was the case, you know, from a technological standpoint, that's fine. If these kind of systems have better figures of merit, um, then that's great in the lab. But as a theorist, there's not much to say, right? Because the James Cummings model is kind of exactly solvable. It's been studied forever. And you can't really find much new physics there. And I think the kind of interesting story that's come around in the past few years is um, when you trap atoms close to these nanophotonic systems, it's not just a, a question of doing all things better. There's really kind of fundamentally new physics and, and exciting physics that can open up. So you can potentially find new paradigms for doing things like quantum information processing, many body physics with atoms, atom trapping, and so on. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of kind of ingredients that go into these systems that make them unique. So just to give you a brief overview, um, you can not only get strong atom-photon interactions, which you can get in principle in these fabric pro cavities as well, but when you confine photons to the nanoscale, basically to the diffraction limit, 
uh, the kind of dispersive forces that you can get with, with single photons with photon exchange can be, can be huge. Okay, so a single photon really packs a big punch on a single atom. Um, in these photonic crystals, because you can de design uh, the dimensionality, uh, you can really control uh, the way that light and atoms talk to each other. And finally, you know, these atoms are going to be within kind of 100, 200 nanometers of dielectric surfaces. So of course, uh, we know that in that case, there's a whole new set of forces that you have to think about, either surface forces or, or quantum vacuum forces. And so that's how I became interested in Casimir, Casimir polar forces. And in the rest of the talk, I'd like to uh, you know, hopefully convince you that uh, these kind of quantum vacuum forces really give you new opportunities in terms of trapping atoms. Um, so before we talk about you know, using Casimir and polar forces to trap atoms, we should just talk about the big game in town, which is trapping atoms by uh, conventional optical forces. So, so how does that work and what are the limits? Um, well, in terms of atom trapping, an atom is basically nothing more than a kind of fancy piece of, uh, fancy little bead of glass. Okay? So you shine an electric, electromagnetic field, and the atom has some dipole polarizability, which depends on frequency. Um, so in that case, uh, the, the kind of mechanical potential that the atom sees is exactly what a little glass bead would see in an optical tweezer. Uh, it's proportional to the polarizability of the atom times the local electric field's intensity. And depending on whether alpha is positive or negative, this atom will be high intensity or low intensity seeking. So that's the, that's the good part of the story. The bad part of the story is um, an atom also has an imaginary part of the polarizability. And what this does in practice is you know, you're, you're trapping atoms with these laser beams that are quite intense. And sometimes your atom will take la uh, photons in that laser beam and scatter it into other directions. And that's proportional to the imaginary part of alpha. The problem with that is atom is very light, so you know, a photon has, a, uh, has momentum. It doesn't seem like a lot of momentum. But when you're a single atom, it's quite significant. So when you scatter that photon in another direction, the atom picks up a random momentum recoil kick. Um, it's also true that when you consider a kind of real model of an atom, an atom has uh, you know, internal spin states. And when you scatter a photon, it tends to mix up those spin states as well. And for atoms, you know, the, the whole thing you want to do is um, you're always trying to store quantum information or quantum coherence in the motional or spin degrees of freedom. So you really want to suppress this kind of random scattering component. Um, in terms of the, the frequency dependence of, of the polarizability, well, the simple model of an atom is just a simple two-level system, uh, a simple resonator. And in that case, the real imaginary parts of the polarizability look like that of a normal harmonic oscillator. Um, so let's say you're designing a, a, an experiment where you're trying to trap atoms and do something with them. Uh, the kind of game you play is something like the following. So you have kind of two knobs at your disposal. How much intensity of light do you send in? And what's the detuning? So at what frequency do you operate relative to the atomic resonance frequency? And so the first thing is um, you want to kind of take care of the bad part, make sure that's not too bad. So you can say, well, I'm going to tolerate a fixed scattering rate of photons. And the thing to notice is that this imaginary part of the polarizability, that decreases with frequency difference or with the tuning, like one over delta squared. So if you want to fix the scattering rate, you operate on some line of constant intensity over detuning squared. Um, the next thing you want to do is you want to trap the atom with some kind of uh, trap depth or confinement. And in that case, you have to look at how the real part of the polarizability decreases with the tuning. And that goes like one over detuning. So if you want to fix the trap depth, that goes like uh, I over delta. And then the current third constraint you have is how much intensity can you send in. Okay, so there's some amount that's realistic, and that defines some kind of practical operating space for your system, for your experiment. Um, so what kind of numbers can you get out? Well, let's just take a simple case where we send, you know, two, uh, let's take two plane waves and send them at each other, so you build up a, a, a standing wave. And then the standing wave is going to have some kind of trap depth you associate with it. You can also just kind of zoom in to, to the middle, to the bottom, and that starts to look like a kind of harmonic oscillator. Um, so the ground state of the oscillator is going to have some zero point motion delta x and some mechanical frequency omega m. And so there's a lot of different kind of atomic physics traps out there and different constraints. So it's hard to kind of put single numbers on every single experiment in the world. But if you're going to kind of take back of the envelope numbers, I would say pretty typically for a kind of functional trap, the kind of trap depths you're talking about from kind of bottom to top are less than 100 microkelvin. The zero point motion is going to be 50 nanometers or more. And the typical mechanical frequency is going to be 100 kilohertz or less. 
And so they're pretty low numbers. And if you ever go to a kind of atomic physics talks, like say, bose einstein condensates or BECs, um, these kind of trap parameters indirectly or actually quite directly feed into the energy scales of those systems. So if you ever go to a talk about BECs, you hear kind of nano Kelvin as the typical energy scale um, arising there. It's really due to the properties of the trap. Um, so here's just the previous slide all over again. And now let's imagine the case where we want to trap atoms near a dielectric surface. Um, so we can just take a kind of planar surface as a simple example. And then we know the Casimir polar force uh, for an atom typically is going to go like minus one over root distance cubed. Okay, so it's an attractive force and it's divergent as you get closer to the surface. If you put in the right kind of coefficient in front, what you find is that, um, so basically if you want to trap atoms closer and closer to the surface, if you don't want atoms to just kind of accelerate towards the surface and collide, um, you have to apply a, kind of a repulsive optical force to counteract it. Okay? And it's obvious that the closer you get, the more intensity you have to send in. Okay? So you, you have to make the trap depth bigger to counteract this thing. And so as you get closer and closer, this kind of contour gets moved further and further. Uh, and especially, eventually you see that uh, at some critical distance, you run out of practical operating space. And that turns out to be about 100 nanometers for uh, a typical experiment. Um, so we see that if you're trying to trap atoms within kind of 100 nanometers of dielectric surfaces, you can't ignore these quantum vacuum forces. They become comparable to the optical forces that you can apply. And this, you know, typically this can lead to loss of stability in, in conventional atomic traps. Uh, but then you can ask a more interesting question, given that these forces are so big, these quantum vacuum forces, is there some way that you can exploit them to create new trapping techniques for atoms? And because they're so big, you can imagine that if you can really exploit this force, you can open up new regimes for atomic physics and its applications. Um, so let me just briefly describe uh, in a kind of one or two kind of cartoon slides what's the basic theory for Casimir polar forces um, of, of atoms. So uh, let's just start from the most famous uh, model Hamiltonian for atom-like interactions with this, the James Cummings model. It's where you describe a, a single two-level atom interacting with uh, a cavity mode, a single cavity mode, whose frequency is pretty close to the transition frequency of the atom. Um, so conceptually, uh, it's pretty clear what can happen, or intuitively. Um, if you start with an excited atom, this Hamiltonian says the atom can drop down to the ground state, and you can create one a photon emits one photon into the cavity mode, or vice versa. And that if we have no losses, that's reversible, and it takes like, it, it occurs at a rate g, which is the famous vacuum Robbie splitting. Okay. Uh, so this describes uh, atoms interacting with a near resonant cavity mode, uh, but it's not the real answer of, of the uh, kind of underlying Hamiltonian. So the real Hamiltonian uh, has kind of two important corrections um, as, as far as Casimir polar forces go. So the first is, um, you know, you never have a single mode optical system. There's always an affinity of modes, either guided or unguided. Um, so you might, for a cavity, care about a certain mode that's particularly close to your transition frequency, but technically other modes exist, and so you have a sum over k over all the different modes. Um, the second thing you get when you have the microscopic uh, atom light Hamiltonian is not only do you have these so-called kind of energy-conserving interactions, where you, for example, go from the excited state down to the ground state and you emit a photon, in principle, you could, for example, start from the ground state, go up to the excited state, and create a photon at the same time. Okay, so these are the kind of combinations of red and green here. Um, of course, in real life, these interaction strengths are too low that you don't really see that uh, in practice, but it still has an effect as a quantum fluctuation. Right? So it, it creates some kind of perturbation for the ground state energy. So what I've drawn here is basically a process where you go from the ground state up to the excited state, you create a photon, and then you reabsorb it. And it gives rise to an energy shift, which is just second order uh, uh, perturbation theory in quantum mechanics. Um, so if you're near surfaces, what happens is um, this G of K depends on, on the electromagnetic mode profile, and that you know, becomes uh, 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 position dependent. And that's basically the Casimir polar potential. So this is just the second order perturbation theory of the ground state energy shift, and now it depends on the atomic position. And so that's the kind of uh, quick view of, of where Casimir polar forces on atoms come from. Um, so it's kind of easy to think of it that way. In practice, it's not so convenient to, to evaluate this thing because you require some kind of decomposition into normal modes k. Um, you know, a number of people have shown that you can uh, take this and rewrite it in a more convenient way in terms of electromagnetic Green's function. And so the, the ground state energy shift you can write in terms of the Green's function. 
find some atomic properties, for example, the, the resonance frequency of the atom and the dipole matrix element. Um, so this is the uh, casimir pulver uh, uh, potential for atoms in the ground state. And then there's two ways you can evaluate this thing practically. So if you have some simple geometry, then you can actually just evaluate this Green's function analytically. And if you have a more complicated device like this photonic crystal, uh, there exists uh, kind of, well, more or less standard uh, techniques this way these days uh, to take conventional electromagnetic software, finite difference time domain, and evaluate Casimir potentials as well. Um, so this is the kind of mathematical form of, of the Casimir potential for, for atoms. Um, but let's talk about what you can and can't do with these Casimir potentials. So, you know, I wasn't really in the fields, and, you know, I think, uh, I guess in the history of Casimir forces, there's been a whole ton of mistakes that people made about, you know, levitation and so on. And kind of not coming from the field, I basically repeated the history of mistakes, and then I found this paper, which was really nice. Um, so this paper is quite general. It doesn't just refer to trapping atoms, but it refers to trapping any, or levitating any dielectric object. And it's basically a no-go theorem. So it says vacuum, uh, three-dimensional stable levitation with vacuum forces is not possible. Um, and it assumes just a few things. So it assumes that you don't have any magnetic materials, so it's a pure kind of dielectric response. The thing you're trying to levitate is surrounded at least in some small epsilon bubble by vacuum, so that's the fair definition of levitation. And the third thing it assumes, which is particularly relevant for atoms, is thermal equilibrium. So how does that translate for, for atoms? Well, if you look at a typical atomic transition frequency, it's somewhere in the infrared or visible. So if you convert that to temperature, that's something like 20,000 Kelvin. And so this thermal equilibrium constraint in practice, it basically means you can't stably levitate an atom with vacuum forces if the atom is in its electronic ground state. It's been known for, for quite some time now that if you bring an atom up to excited state, you could have you know, attraction or repulsion. Um, the problem with excited states, as far as it relates to kind of other things you want to do with atoms, is excited states, typical excited states, are not very stable. So they drop back down to the ground state by spontaneously emitting a photon. Um, so those seem like the ground rules. And uh, what I'd like to do now is give kind of briefly three examples of ways that you can use Casimir polar forces uh, to your advantage in atomic tapping in a way that respects these constraints. And these three examples are going to go, I guess, in kind of order of increasing ambition. Um, so the first example is actually quite relevant to the current, uh, current experiments. And so let me just describe more carefully how atoms might be trapped in this intervening space between two dielectric waveguides. Um, so a lot of this kind of atomic trapping uh, just takes advantage of your ability to engineer the dispersion relation of guided modes in these photonic crystals. Um, so what I've shown here, what I'm showing here is a kind of simplified band structure for uh, the guided modes. So on the vertical axis is the frequency of the guided mode, and on the horizontal axis is block wave vector. And the red denote two different guided bands. And the dimensions of the structure are chosen so that the band edges align pretty closely um, to two different resonance frequencies or two different transition wavelengths of atomic cesium. Um, so one of these bands is going to serve the purpose of trapping uh, via standard optical forces. So if you, took, if you take a one unit cell, of this uh, so-called alligator structure. What you see here is the intensity profile of the guided mode. And what you see is exactly halfway in between these two dielectric waveguides, there's actually a local intensity minimum. There's a zero. Okay. And so what that means is if you send in blue detuned light, then the atom has a, has a negative polarizability. And so atoms will just naturally want to seek out this point in the middle and be trapped there. So optical forces provide a trapping uh, potential in this kind of plane of the structure in a two-dimensional plane. The issue is because of the symmetry of the device, if you were to look out of the plane, so into and out of the board, it's actually a complete nodal line for the electric field. The electric field is zero everywhere along that line. And so you can ask, you know, how is it possible to confine atoms in, the, in that direction, in and out of the board? Well, it's actually Casimir polar forces that do the job. Okay, so, you know, the Casimir forces at lowest order, it just means that atoms like to kind of get attracted to dielectric. So if the atom is sitting very far out of the plane, then it just wants to get sucked into the board. Of course, what it really wants to do is it wants to kind of accelerate towards one of the dielectric structures, but then the optical forces are able to counteract that. Okay, so it's the Casimir forces that close the trap in the third direction, and you can kind of see this here. So in this uh, kind of potential profile here, 
z is the direction into and out of the board, and this kind of uh, local minimum in the z direction is purely due to uh, Kastner folder forces. And uh, this kind of, so it's basically a hybrid trap where optical forces combine in two dimensions and Casimir in the third. And then, uh, of course, the Casimir potential is a saddle point, and so the no-go theorem is, is still preserved. Um, so it's not completely uh, relevant, I mean, it's not so relevant to the Casimir forces, but maybe just to complete the story, um, once the atoms are trapped here, um, you can exploit this kind of second band here to do kind of normal atomic physics. In particular, if you look at the guided mode intensity, um, of, of this band, you see there's a very strong field intensity there. And that means that you know, when you send in uh, single photons in the guided mode, there's a pretty strong probability that that single photon will interact with the atom if they're on resonance. So one way you can quantify that is you can kind of flip it around. You can say if I bring the atom up to the excited state, um, it's going to spontaneously emit a photon. And what's the fraction or probability that it emits a photon into the guided mode versus into free space? And that's about 50% for this current structure. And that's by no means a fundamental limit, it's just a kind of uh, technical limit uh, imposed by basically impedance matching of the device. Okay, so uh, that was kind of example number one. Um, now I'll go to example number two. And let me maybe present a bit of motivation uh, for this example. Um, so this goes into the one of the big games in town that people are trying to play with, with cold atoms. Um, so, uh, for a long time now, people have been able to trap ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices. So an optical lattice, in this case, is a two-dimensional optical lattice, so you shine in laser beams from, uh, from two, two different dimensions, and you build up a standing wave or egg, you know, egg carton potential in those two dimensions. And if you have cold atoms uh, sitting in this potential, there's basically two things they can do. Um, they can either hop from site to site at a rate j, or if two atoms are on the same site, in the case of their bosons, they can have some on-site interaction energy with a strength U. Okay. Uh, so this is the famous bose hubbard model, and it's famous because it's kind of the textbook example of a Hamiltonian of quantum system, a many-body system, with a quantum phase transition. So when U and J become comparable to each other, the system goes from a superfluid state to a so-called mock insulating state. And then you can ask, well, what are the parameters U and J in terms of the lattice uh, parameters? So in particular, uh, how does it depend on the lattice constant? And not so surprisingly, as you make the lattice smaller and smaller, if you can make the lattice more dense, then the maximum tunneling rate goes like 1 over the, the <laughs> lattice constant squared, whereas the interaction strength goes like 1 over the lattice constant cubed. Okay. And in terms of real numbers, if you take something like atomic cesium, for a conventional optical lattice made by optical forces, that maximum tunneling rate is going to be in the kind of few kilohertz range, and that increases by two orders of magnitude if you're somehow able to create a lattice of 50 nanometer spacing. Um, so one thing I should say is the bose hubbard model, or this kind of uh, super fluid to mine insulator transition, that's been seen with atoms already. And that really opened up the field. And now the kind of uh, big game that people are trying to play is, well, if we can control the interactions of atoms well enough, then maybe we can create more fancy Hamiltonians with other quantum phase transitions. And ideally, these Hamiltonians are ones that we don't know the answer to theoretically. And so we don't know the answer theoretically, but in the lab, maybe we can build it up and just see what the answer is experimentally. And so the issue with that game going forward is um, we don't really have an example, a good example yet in the fields, where we've taken a Hamiltonian where theorists don't know the answer to and just create it in the lab. And the reason is because the energy scales of the system are just too low. Okay. Um, so one way to maybe get around that is to find a way to create optical lattice, an optical lattice with a closer spacing to increase the energy scales of these systems. Um, so that's where Casimir polar forces come in. This is basically, in this language, maybe the lateral Casimir polar force. So let's imagine, for example, that I design some kind of two-dimensional dielectric structure, which is periodic. And if I can somehow float the atoms in a two-dimensional plane above the structure, uh, these atoms are going to feel a lateral Casimir force in that two-dimensional plane. So as atoms move above the post and then uh, between the middle and above the post, it's going to see an oscillating potential. And the nice thing about having an oscillating potential this way, so some kind of uh, lattice potential this way, is that Casimir polar forces, they don't obey the diffraction limit. And so no matter how close I make these posts, as long as, as the atoms are close enough above, I'm always going to have a good contrast in that Casimir polar potential. And so you can kind of see this here. This is just a kind of numerical simulation of a lattice constant of 50 nanometers. And uh, this is the potential the atoms see in this two-dimensional plane. 
most of it is due to Casimir Polder forces. So you can ask a kind of uh, you know, competing question, what if I just shine light onto the structure? The light is going to interfere and scatter off these little posts, but you know, light obeys the diffraction limit. So there is going to be a little bit of an optical lattice potential created, but that's just the blue line here. So you see that you know, the, in principle there is an optical lattice that's created, but the depth of it is way smaller than what you can achieve with the Casimir Holder force. And you can ask, well, why, why, would I, why would I calculate this kind of optical potential in the first place? Why do, why do I need to send light in? Again, it's because of this no-go theorem. So um, the no-go theorem says that atoms aren't just going to be stably levitated in this plane above the post. Of course, they just want to kind of expel it towards the post and stick onto them. And so you do need a laser in this kind of vertical direction to kind of levitate atoms off the post. Okay? So again, that preserves the no-go theorem. And of course, this must be quite strong, okay? it's because the, the because the Casimir polar force uh, gets larger and larger as the atoms get closer. If you try to make a smaller and smaller lattice, you still have to play this game where you increase the intensity more and more, the optical intensity more and more. Um, so that finally gets to example number three, which is, I guess, the most ambitious one. Um, so again, here's the no-go theorem. It basically says that you know if you have an atom in its electronic ground state, um, you can't have a stable Casimir polar potential. Um, it's known for excited states that you can have a repulsive uh, effect. But then the nice thing about quantum mechanics is you don't have to have an atom in its ground state or its excited state. You can create a quantum superposition, a dress state. And so that technically that's out of equilibrium as well. And I guess a conceptual question you can ask is, you know, if I can create any superposition, is there some way, at least formally, where I can take the mixing, you know, so I put a little bit of population up in the excited state, is there some way conceptually that I can take that mixing angle and send it to zero and still have a stable trap? So what do I have to, what's the underlying system that I would need in order to do that? Um, so now I have to talk about, so it's clear now that you know, somehow excited states are involved, so I start talking about the shifts of, of atoms in their excited states. Um, so the excited state sees, uh, on one hand, a shift that's very similar to the ground state. So if I'm up in the excited state, it's possible in principle that I emit a completely opalescent photon and reabsorb it. And that gives rise to a Casimir polar potential for the excited state, which is just minus that of the ground state. But the excited state has one special thing about it, which is it can emit a real photon. Right? And so there's this one extra contribution to the Casimir polar potential, which is basically the interaction between uh, the excited state and the kind of resonant photon that's, that it's emitting. And that uh, contribution to the Casimir polar shift is going to be proportional to the real part of the Green's function, but evaluated at a single frequency, at the resonance frequency of the atom. So this is a completely classical effect um, that I would just get from a kind of oscillating dipole. And so maybe that sounds a little bit like stranger language, but if I talk about the complementary aspects, you know, if I talk about the spontaneous emission rate, um, that spontaneous emission rate formally depends on the imaginary part of G. And the spontaneous emission rate, we've been you know, uh, manipulating that for, for decades now. Okay, so for example, we've been putting atoms in cavities to enhance the emission. We've been using plasmonic systems and, and, and so on. And it's just a question of you know, creating a, a system, a photonic system, with a good ratio of quality factor to mode volume. And so we, we're pretty good these days about enhancing the spontaneous emission rate. And what we basically want to do is take similar systems and learn to kind of maximize this term instead. Um, so let me take a simple example, just a one-dimensional system. So let's just try to let, uh, trap atoms in the plane normal. Um, so the kind of resonant term for this excited state is I can interpret classically, right? So I take a dipole, I get it oscillating with the laser, and if it's a kind of flat dielectric, I know that I can interpret the response as due to a kind of image dipole underneath the surface. And an induced dipole goes like epsilon minus one over epsilon plus one. So in principle, I can see I can blow up that dipole response if I can have some material where epsilon passes through minus one. So the simplest example of that is the Druda model. Okay. Um, so we can take that as a toy model. Uh, there's two parameters that are relevant, the quality factor of the Druda model and the detuning from the resonance frequency. Um, so let's take a look at the results, um, or the kind of cartoon of what happens. So um, if I'm if I'm an atom in the ground state, then I see a kind of normal Casimir polar potential that goes, that's attractive and goes like one over distance cubed. Um, if I'm in an excited state, I get this kind of non-resonant contribution, which is just minus that of the ground state. But this resonant contribution, basically that of seeing the kind of resonant dipole, 
A mass goes like one over uh, distance cubes, and it's uh, repulsive. But it's enhanced by basically the quality factor of the resonance. And of course, I can't enhance that without enhancing the spontaneous emission rate as well. So that also is enhanced by the quality factor, but it's with a different power in detuning. Okay. And so I can basically win if I can uh, operate in this kind of situation where I have a very large quality factor, and I choose a detuning where this kind of dispersive repulsion for the excited state is still large, but the enhancement of spontaneous emission is still uh, negligible. Um, so the way you create a trap is the following. Um, you have a laser frequency, you're free to choose what it is. And the laser frequency comes into resonance with the atom somewhere. Okay. So that's the kind of, it's a nice duality. So if I put the atom in the ground state or side state, there's this kind of dispersive uh, shift or potential. But it also translates spatially into a changing resonance frequency with respect to position. So when I choose a laser frequency, it only comes into resonance with the atom at one particular point. So if I choose parameters correctly, um, if I start with an atom far away, it sees a laser that's far off resonance, so it's basically in the ground state. But then as I get closer and closer, um, the atom gets closer to the resonance frequency. And then I start to put a little bit of population up in the excited state. It's a dress state. And then this dress state starts to get repelled from the surface. Um, so it's a kind of trapping of an adiabatic dress state. And then with high Q, you can basically create almost like a hard wall. Um, so I think uh, I'm kind of running out of time, but um, maybe just to kind of give one interesting result. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is this is not some kind of dipole force in disguise. Okay, so you can ask um, if I have this attractive uh, vacuum force for the ground state, if I use this kind of potential, for example, some kind of evanescent field to repel the atom, um, I have to apply a minimum electric field that's one over distance cubed. But in this kind of dress state picture here, in this dress state trapping, I can suppress that electric field by the quality factor of the material. And the reason that it's not some dipole force in disguise is um, here we're exploiting the fact that the polarizability of the atom is a function of position. Okay, so this kind of formula here does not apply anymore. Um, so we've done the analysis. It's a bit of a kind of, I mean, it's very much a toy model, but I think it's a kind of promising one to explore in kind of a more realistic geometry, in particular photonic crystal. Uh, uh, later on. And so with that I'll conclude and hopefully I can convince you at least to some extent that kind of merging atomic physics and nanophotonics is a really exciting frontier uh, of the field. Thanks. Time for maybe one question. So one of the themes of your talk is how to get around this Nogo theorem that says there can be no trapping by pure Casimir forces alone. And your idea is to introduce optical forces in addition. A great one. But there's uh, at least two proposals for how to get around, or at least two ways that have been proposed for how to get around the Nogo theorem. One is to do a Jeremy Monday experiment where you do your Casimir forces in a dielectric background, which I assume would have no relevance for this because the experiments are in high vacuum. Right. And then the other thing is something, a theoretical proposal that Steve Lamro referenced in his talk, which is Take a highly anisotropic polarizable particle and sort of surfactant molecule mm -hmm. and place it above a hole in a metal plate. Then you get repulsive Casimir forces which don't evade the no-go theorem because they're not stable. But could something like that be used in addition to, you know, in conjunction with your optical forces to get around the lack of stability? In principle, yes. I think for the kind of atoms that I'm talking about, no, because the atoms that we're talking about here are isotropic, right? So it's but for example, if you had something like a molecule which really had a kind of anisotropic polarizability. Is there any analog of your kind of experiments with sort of surfactant molecules or long, thin polarizable <laughs> particles? I can't think of one. I mean, at least if it's this kind of simple, you know, so what I'm talking about here is trapping a single cesium atom, for example, which is basically just a, a sphere. Right, so maybe if I had some kind of, uh, you know, even like a dipolar molecule, maybe I could start to trap uh, atoms in, in the way that you're, or trap those molecules in the way they're talking about. But yeah, for a kind of simple atom like, like the one I'm considering here, um, I, I, I've thought about it, but I don't see a way to make it work. Okay, thank you. Thank you.